All right, so I gotta go really quick, um, just because I wanna make sure I get through everything. So I'm gonna do a weird thing. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, you all to tweet at the Sierra Interactive uh, account because somebody's here to monitor it. But um, I'm watching other presenters and something that Chris just showed about the Wayback Machine, that was like great idea. Um, we have not sourced this code or, or, or opened it for anybody. But um, we have a way of uh, taking all the H1s, paragraphs, images, and a few other things from, um, from the Wayback Machine for any URL and comparing it um, every time it changed and telling you how much it changed at scale. So tweet at here and I'll see if I can get Ethan to write that up. We've had that for a couple um, years and it's a super great way to look at more than just a few URLs at a time. All right, now let me talk about what I'm gonna talk about, um, which is that today's got a good chance of being disappointing. Um, and the reason why is because just like Gary Vee, I'm gonna say the same shit. And it's a superpower when you know you say the same shit, right? Like it's only when people are like, you say the same shit. You're like, yeah, I told you I say the same shit. Because I was looking back and I was having a nostalgic moment looking back at the hashtag and, of MozCon and, and the things that, I, that I've presented over the last 11 years here on stage. And it's just super freaking humbling. I'm super grateful. Um, but then the thing about repeating yourself is this. I mean, one of the pressures of being a speaker is sometimes I'm always like, yo, I gotta drop this new thing. And then sometimes the new stuff isn't as good as me reminding you to do the old shit I showed you four years ago. So now you're getting shortchanged because I'm like, I can't show the same thing because Ross saw it once. And the other like 900 of you are like, well, we didn't see it. <laughs> so the roots on what I present hasn't really changed that much. You know, if you can read this, this is 2015 on this stage. This is something that we had given out. If anybody was here, remember when we gave out those like tiles? And I gave you those tiles to remind you of what it felt like to find something you lost. Because so often we have the power to help people find something that they're looking for. But we forget that that's a really cool freaking job, you guys. So I left these tiles behind. And someone took this picture and I appreciate that picture because I found it. That's seven years ago. I don't know if Monique is here. Girl, I'm sorry that you didn't get one. And while I was cleaning out the office, I found one for you. So at the Sear Interactive handle, and somebody here has one for you, and I hope the thing still works. It's seven years old, the battery probably died. Anyway, but something that I said in, in that card that, I, that some of you got was like, we have the power to influence what people find. And when you find something you've been looking for, it's like such a relief. So let me show you my, my kids in my old office. There's my Ikea desk from college. My two kids are loading the washing machine. It wasn't really conducive for <laughs> working from home. <laughs> and then four months ago, I moved and I got this nice walnut thing, whatnot, right? Looking like a real CEO, I guess. But my screen and my wife, we can now both work in the same room. So yay, we can both work together. But the screens get in the way of us seeing each other. So I'm trying to find a way to find a mount that doesn't mount them both back to back because when she moves her monitor, I don't want my monitor to move, but then I don't want two different stands. So if somebody can find a solution for me, you will be my version of the tile and I will give you a hug. Please tweet at me with your solutions. I've been looking and Googling shit for four months. All right. So I'm gonna tell you what I've been giving you up here for 10 years. We're gonna talk about customers, business, big data, and silos. Same concepts. And I wish I could throw out all the people in the room that have the big budgets. Because what I enjoy more than anything, more than anything is beating people with really big budgets for clients who don't have really big budgets. It's fun to be like, you have more money than me, but you don't think the way that I think and my team thinks. So you can't just outspend your way into beating me and my client. And I don't know if you can see that, but we went up against the client. This, so this is a career defining moment for me. If you ask me the quintessential moment in my career that just makes me feel like I got those mother effers was the time that we were working on a prescription sleep aid and uh, our competitor had a hundred million dollar outdoor TV, everything campaign. They were everywhere. Anybody remember the Rosarum ads with like the Abe Lincoln and like the hedgehog that was talking to the guy that couldn't sleep? These people were dropping a hundred million dollars, but as the article says, they didn't educate anybody about the fact that it was a non-prescriptive sleep aid. So guess what we did with our $5,000 a month budget at the time? 
we optimized for everything in their commercials. So every time they ran the ads, my client got all the free traffic from it. A hundred million dollars spent and they couldn't get the traffic from it because we took the rankings by just looking at their scripts. Gosh, I loved that. Nerd rage, right? Like I love when my nerd powers give me like power over like rich people. All right, so something that kind of hurt, you know, I, I love to share with you all, a lot of my innovation comes from things that I've seen my team do that I don't want to be as a company, right? So I'm like, why did we do that? And one time I had tears in my eyes. My team put together this like 50 slide deck for this um, client in the healthcare space. And I open up every slide deck for my team, open it up, hit control F and just do um, look for the dollar sign. And if I don't see a dollar sign, I'm not happy. Um, I've even looked into building a, a, a plug-in for Chrome to find out whether or not that's being done because we got to talk about dollars, right? So I'm like in tears, right? I'm like, we got to talk about money, guys. We got to talk about money. So then I'm like, they're like, okay, we'll talk to the client. Four months later, I'm like, where's the dollar signs in the report? It's like painful, right? I'm like, where's the dollar signs? And it's like, well, Will, we asked for revenue from the client or lifetime value. And then, you know, they said, we'll get that. And then they said, well, we don't have it. And then we waited two more weeks for them to get it back to us. And it just went back and forth, right? Whereas me, I'm like, no lifetime value, no problem. I see an opportunity. I see an opportunity for greatness. Why? Because I believe that at work, the limit to your greatness is going to be rooted in how quickly you fold at the first time somebody tells you no. That's it. Like, don't try to be great, accept mediocrity. Because it's a lot more calming when you give yourself the grace to be like, I'm not trying to be great. I'm just trying to make my check, go home, feed these kids, be home at whatever time. But if you wanna be great, you gotta look at everything that all the people you work against and are going up against, stop at and say, well, that's not possible. And you gotta be like, I need to find a way. So, or as Coding MILF says, don't close the door yourself. Let others tell you no, and then figure out how to work around them, which I love. I met her, um, I started following her through an organization called Underdog Devs that helps people coming out of the prison system learn to code, which is a really great organization. I'd recommend all of you take a look at them and try to support and help those folks. They're amazing. They're an amazing organization. So we just gotta be scrappy, right? And scrappy marketers Google shit. Isn't it funny how quickly people accept no when they could go type, 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 enter and just read some stuff? So I said, what's the average revenue from an urgent care visit? I Googled it. My team spent four months waiting to ask for this number from the client. I Googled it and was like, here's one, two, three into the four samples that we can literally just use that are coming from, like, I just Googled it. Like, stop waiting for your client to give you a number to justify your value because then you're sitting there going, why don't we get budget? Because you didn't Google shit. You didn't Google the stuff that you can find to show them. And then I got rid of my team 60 slide deck that they had spent hours on and I built this spreadsheet and it said here's our assumptions on the opportunity there's a value per session and here are the numbers that I think you're going to make per reservation as an urgent care center here's a secret ask somebody for a number they they won't get they won't be able to give it to you give them something to react to and they're like that number seems really high you're like oh so it's obviously not that number thanks I've been waiting for four months to try to justify my value if you don't give somebody something to compare it to, how long is a long stick? This is a long stick. If the other stick I showed you was that long. So then I take um, the value from CPC data, because you know I love joining stuff across silos. And I say, well, wait, we're gonna get credit for all the clicks that come because if, you're, if it's the same keyword or similar keyword sets, and you're willing to spend 30 grand a year to get those people to your site, don't tell me that my rankings aren't worth some version of that. You're willing to pay $5 a click for these keywords. Here's the kicker. Stop kicking off projects trying to show the client how smart you are. You should trust me because I've been doing this for 20 years. No, 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 no. That kind of shit is stupid. Instead, ask your client the right questions. Questions like, what do you read to understand the business of your business? So then when you come back with your assumptions, you get to link to the stuff that they told you in the kickoff to read. 
well, you know, I read the, um, the journal, uh, the medical journal on urgent care centers, and I got it from the thing that you told me was a good source. And they're like, okay, well, I guess you can use it then. Thank you. Now I can talk about revenue instead of rankings or some other bullshit. So now I've got um, the cost of the opportunity is the next thing that I put in my calculator, right? So we, sometimes we act as if our clients and our, 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 just like the money just comes out of nowhere. Like you have to show them what it's going to cost for them to take advantage of the thing you found. So therefore, I put in some hourly estimates. They go, oh, that's not right. I go, well, then what do you think? They go, probably about half that. Great. And I just type the number in, and then all the ROI of my campaign updates in my spreadsheet. And my team had like slide after slide for each recommendation and bullets and screen grabs. They must have spent like 20 hours on that. I was like, I ain't using none of that to talk to this client. I'm going to say, here's the recommendation. Here's how long I think it's going to take for your team and my team to do. You add them all up, and you get a cost of how, long, how much time it's going to, uh, how much it's going to cost to do it. Then I go, what kind of return are you expecting on your investment? Ah, I need a 15, 15 to 1. All right, cool. Well, when I put all these numbers together, I got to hit the best case scenario to make that happen. Should we even be talking to you about this project? Is that something that you're comfortable with? Because I only think we got a 20% chance of hitting the best case scenario. Then we have to talk about opportunity cost. Where else can you invest the same amount of money and get the same back with 20% certainty or higher, because maybe you should invest in that instead of what I'm talking to you about. Real consulting isn't do what I'm asking. Real consulting is how is the most value created, and sometimes that's me, and sometimes it's not me. All right, man, this is, I got, I'm low on time already. So, um, all right, so we're gonna talk about how to use the search results to understand the customer better. It's my thing, right? And I'm gonna give you like a quick, easy one, and then we'll get generally more complex. So where am I bidding on a keyword? So if I'm bidding on the word download Monday, Right? I got download in Monday. Great. But Google's already learned that that's a support query. So why am I landing somebody on a page saying sign up? That should be maybe one of your tests. All my SaaS people, consider that. For my SaaS people who bid on other people's brands, consider that. Have you ever looked at your search terms, ran them through stat or some tool, and looked at whether or not that company's support site is ranking in the number one position because Google's already learned that that's probably the right answer? Are you bidding on those words? Anybody doing that? There, oh, y'all some smart motherfuckers over there. There we go, we got one over there. Like that's basics to me. Like tell them Kamala, you don't do nothing else. It's basics. <laughs> All right, so I like to focus my keyword research on pain points and to see if I can do that to help my clients also build better products. And I think that power is uniquely ours. Here's the Pixel 6. Man, did everybody see the Pixel 6 as being advertised to black folks? I was like, are they that good at targeting because I'm black? Or is it just like spray and pray? <laughs> because everywhere I went, I was like, man, like I guess only black people are using like the, the Pixel 6. Like, I don't know. Like so many ads I was seeing were black folks and their new camera and how it was the most inclusive camera ever built. And they came up with this thing called Real Tone, which made sure that they solved this problem of, of photographing dark skin, which is actually solving a problem for me. Because if you look at the percentage of African or sub-Saharan sub African blood in my family, I'm about 85%. Nico's about 75. Rio's about 30. And my wife is Irish AF. So this actually solves a real problem for my family. Many of you don't have to think about that, but when you've got that many different shades of color in your family, you try to take a picture, it's like, why do I always got to put Nico like right under the really light light so that he doesn't totally black out? But then my other kids all washed out. It's like, I can't take a good picture to save my life because these things are often built by people that don't have my experience. All right. So if it's not a problem for you, how can you be a part of solving a problem? I actually think keyword research is how we gain empathy for our customers. But we use keyword research for rankings. We use keyword research to, to label our company's dentist near me. And then because we think those are cool tactics, somebody drops that on stage and then somebody else copies it with ER near me. And then you think that's cool. And then somebody who works with a small business is like, don't name your doctor's office after your name. Your new name is Black Female Therapist LLC, girl. Like, come on now. You could do the exact same work as, a, as an exercise in empathy for your customer. Right? So I like to ask myself, what if I was sitting in a room where there's never an SEO person added into the room ever? 
What value would I create? What do I know that I could add value in a product meeting when you're talking about what features are going to make it into the Pixel 6? They're like, why would we ever add an SEO into a meeting to talk about what features we're going to put into the Pixel 6? It's because I know how to turn these rankings, tracking things into customer understanding, and you need to sell this shit to customers. Google scrape your own stuff. So all I do is process clues. And if you can learn at the, by the end of this presentation to learn to look at everything as a clue, I think it will change the way you look at the search results. And I love the related searches. So let's just say I go, hey, Pixel team, you know what? We're going to bid on 5,000 photographing words to find out what people like to photograph so we can harvest not only the interest, but I also want to see what customers are seeking. And then all of a sudden, guess what I get? Camera settings. All right, so now you want my SEO ass in your product meeting, potentially, because I'm saying, you know what, wouldn't it be cool if we built something that somebody had to go through all the different steps to get the settings right on the iPhone to get the picture of their family correct versus how you can just whip out your phone and take a picture of your multiracial family and have it work perfectly? Oh, but if you don't invite me into the room because you think all I do is rank shit, you're missing out. Do you see how I can create product strategy if somebody gets me in the room and I want more of you to get in the room, but you got to look at these clues as something that gets you entree into those rooms. All right. So often, this is what we applaud each other for. This would be like me walking back and forth on stage and saying nothing and be like, got 10,000 steps in. And all of y'all are like, yay, he got in 10,000 steps. It's like you didn't learn shit. All I did was walk. Look at this. And there's 143 likes on it. So that means some of y'all motherfuckers in here like that shit. <laughs> and why am I here repeating the same stuff I always say? Because I said it 10 fucking years ago. And we're applauding that crap that's got nothing to do with making anybody any freaking money. So that's why we're not invited into the other rooms, because we applaud bullshit. We need to be focused on money, man. Ten years ago, I'm like, this makes no sense. Like, don't do this. And then somebody does, and they're like, oh, my God, you wrote like a 15,000-word thing. Like, oh, you're so good, man. F that, yo. This is, a, this is one of my beliefs. The less you know about your customer, the more it's going to cost you to acquire them. So let me give you a really good example of this. I'm going to be talking a lot about engrams, and I don't have the time to explain it to you because I'm almost supposed to be done, which ain't going to happen, um, but I'm going to try my best to finish on time. Um, primary care physician, one of my clients, right? So I'm looking at primary care doctor or whatever, and their cost per lead is $14.72. When you add the word black in front of primary, the cost per lead goes up 30%. We got to get really good at analyzing all these clues around these words to understand our customers. Because now I can use that clue to hit three different types of people. I can hit the ROI person in the room. I can hit the DE&I person in the room, right? If people are putting black in front of it and our landing page doesn't have any black people on it, that's not good. If we're saying like, oh, we love the black people, right? We have our customers are frustrated, so now I can hit the UX people. So you see how I get my keyword research into all these different areas. I can go talk to the CFO with that. And then I just do Google Trends and see like, hey, this is a trend. This is changing for your customer. Your customer is changing their language, and we are behind the times. And so is everybody else because no one processes these clues. And client, you can be the first one to move on this. So this is what it looks like. Every time there's a search term that triggers a, uh, in paid, we bring it in, all, we bring in that data every, every week, and then we run all the rankings on all those words and get the top 100 results and all those clues for every single search term. So on any given month, we might be looking at, oh my God, we might pull in the top 100 for, you know, four, five, six million keywords. And what we start to be able to do is to say to our client, hey, when this word is used, around your other words. Here was your CPA 12 months ago. Here was your CPA three months ago. Here was your CPA one month ago. Then I'm checking spend to make sure you're still spending on that word. I can't just do the 12 month spend because if you negated it three months ago, I'm gonna look like a fool, which I did a lot of times. And I'm like, you need to negate these words, idiot. And they're like, we already did. I'm like, whoops, my bad. Um, and then I got to put up conversions because I got to help you to realize that, you know, this, you don't get these savings for free. You actually have to choose to give up those conversions because you're potentially not efficient or we need to create better landing pages. Okay. See that? I have this 
for every single piece of every word that every single client has ever spent on a keyword. So I take the keyword, break it apart into all the different pieces, stitch that back together, and that's how I get that. And then it's running on every client every week to find any time there's a change in the customer's language. And we're getting worse and worse and worse at servicing that language because our CPA keeps going up, 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 up when people put the word black anywhere around their doctor queries. Are you following me? Are you? Because sometimes I get a little nerdy about this stuff. If you don't, then I don't know how else you're going to understand the changes that your customer is making to their language. And I understand that when I understand my customer's language better, I get entree into more rooms, and I want you to get entree into more rooms. All right. So, and then I always show the client the current state because I'm telling them we got a chance to be the first people to figure this out. And they go, really, Will? And I go, yeah, because I searched for black OBGYN, and the first homegirl, she ain't black. And then, like, ZocDoc's not a client, but I'd rather work with the people that are less funded than ZocDoc and be like, yo, you know what? You're spending all this money on black doctors and have no black people on the page. So if we do it, they're going to be like, why is it that they can do just as good as us with half the budget? It's like because we're finding all the instances where they're broad matching and we're not, and we're creating new landing pages that speak to the customer in their language. When I put black in front of OBGYN, I don't want Dr. Sonia Lee. I'm sorry. And you know what's really sad? When we as content marketers and SEOs don't do our jobs well, sites like this rank number one for that query. And you see that get alone at the top? This is a fucking scam. To take black people who don't have proper credit and get them high interest loans to pay off their credit card, to pay off their doctor's bills. That's what happens when we don't do our jobs well and we build crap content because we don't outrank that crap. All right, let me give you all an e-commerce example. So I'm, I'm buying a dining room table I just moved four months ago. So I'm doing a lot of searches like this. Something I thought was really interesting is if you categorize Overstock as an e-commerce domain, you are technically correct, but that is actually a content page. That is a blog post. That is not a PLP. So what's interesting about the search term is I was like, oh, shit, Google has learned something. Their top three results for dining room table were blog content. They were not PLPs. Do you, are you bringing in and harvesting the data fast enough to know when Google has changed what they think it is? Because you're going to be the one brought in to be, why isn't our furniture stuff selling as much? You're like, I don't know, I'm going to optimize the PLP. Wrong answer, dog. Google's looking for a different answer. And what I really love about the team at Overstock is they're doing both. So as Google's algorithms change and Google learns more about a query and they go, oh, well, maybe it should be this. No, maybe it should be that. No, maybe it should be that. They're like, we got both of them. So then I had to do like a thousand search queries to find out what a live edge table was. I'm like, oh, wood table with the, with the wavy edge? Well, the queries were horrible, but that's how real people search. And then I learned what a live edge table was, okay? So like I love to look at where does adding one word change my competitive set. So here's what's interesting, right? I added the word live edge. My number one competitor was not an e-com site or a publisher anymore. Traditionally, it was Etsy. Gosh, I love finding outlier competitors. The competitors people give you, we could all do that. The value is in showing your clients competitors they didn't know they had. That's how you get people to be like, you think differently. Maybe I should invite you into this other meeting. So what I like to do is roll up across my clients and go, where are my e-commerce clients bidding on keywords? Where Etsy's number one or two? Is my CPA higher? Yeah, it is for all of them. You know why? Because if you're an SEO 101, you're like, Etsy's a domain, and here's the number of links, and here's the domain authority. If you're an advanced SEO, you're like, Etsy is a movement. Etsy means all this stuff. So when Etsy ranks number one, I don't see Etsy. When Etsy ranks number one for these keywords and none of those other traditional e-com uh, home sites do, I think people don't want a middleman when they buy a live edge table. They want to know where in the world their stuff is coming from. They want to support the local artisan. They want something that's unique that they're not going to see in somebody else's house. And they want to support a small business. That's what Etsy.com means. But if you only look at it as a domain, you are missing out on the ability to communicate a different type of value to your client. And then to do that at scale and say everywhere Etsy shows up, if my CPA is significantly higher, that means I'm probably not solving the customer's question. And if I'm not solving the customer's question, why am I bidding on this word with my Wayfair, Urban Loft, Square, Solid. Like, I don't want that. I want Etsy. And Google already found out that we want a custom live edge table. I do not want that from you. All right. 
They don't even have a live edge table on the, on the page. Damn it. All right, so I haven't scraped this out yet, but I'm getting really close. Um, it's really difficult. So if somebody's done this, please at us because I would like to partner with you and help. You know, I'm sharing my stuff. You share your stuff. That's how we all get better. Um, so Live Edge has all the pricing and stuff and those product features. Noah might have this. Um, but see how the pricing is different when you put in um, Live Edge? See the pricing? Different for Live Edge than the pricing here. You know how valuable that would be? To do at scale? Where is your pricing for, your, that, for what you're bidding on? Oh, you're bidding on a, so you're bidding on this word. Your table costs $3,100, and we're finding out that the range for tables is 400 to 800 traditionally. Then you can just search. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Power BI kind of guy, so I'm like, okay, then I'm going to take all my queries that match that kind of pattern and say, how much higher is my CPA? Another thing that um, I think competitor domains tell you, and I'm going to get into this in a little bit more, is when something like auto, I have an auto insurance client, we're doing an auto word, and you see all the domains up there are like the auto insurance companies. The minute you add the n-gram cheap to auto, you get a different type of diversity in the SERP, which means, oh, snap, maybe I need to sound more like a publisher, potentially. And I got to talk about how my, how my auto insurance compares to other companies because I'm bidding on these words, but I'm ultimately not going to solve the problem as well because Google's decided another type of site might be a better answer. All right. Hey, who knew? Looking at that stuff, kill spiders? This is where people want to kill spiders. Who knew? And I don't think there's a tool on the planet that harvests those yet. That's a competitive advantage if somebody can figure it out. And then you've got products on this page. And years ago, Dr. Pete was on this stage, and he showed the word vacuum. And he showed how there were all these different reviews in there, and there were all these different products in there. And it was like a really busy SERP, which meant your little organic ranking probably wasn't going to do as much because of all the stuff that was surrounded by the SERP. So while I can't get the little numbers out of the filters, what I can get is I can get all the different filters because they come through as titles in my scrapes. So now I can see all the different things that are competing with my number one ranking. And because I'm bringing in the search term, I can say, okay, what does my CPA look like? How am I performing when I have a bunch of these things competing with my number one ranking? Then you take that search term. I see you. I like you because you're getting this. Um, and then I take that number one ranking or my ranking, then I join that to my GSC. So now I can start to build models out that say, hey, when I rank and there's all this other stuff around my number one ranking, how much does my CPA typically, how much does my click-through rate typically drop? Now when I'm talking to my client about the revenue I can drive, I might need to dial that down because I got so many other things, other boxes competing with me. But I'll tell you, most of our tools give us, oh, it's video. Uh, it's, um... It's, uh, people also ask, and it's these things, but there's all these other boxes in there that you may not even know if you're not running this stuff at scale. All right, ah, this is so unfair. I've been gone for like two years, and I have a half hour. All right, so how does um, pay perform on this? How, what's my click-through rate in organic? I said all those things. So like, I like to imagine myself in rooms where I'm not invited. Hey, well, we're coming up with a TikTok strategy. Bring me in, right? Hey, we're coming up with a new thing for Google Discover. Bring me in. I got something for you, right? So I've been working on this concept of how can I, as an SEO, help people pick better visuals for TikTok and things of that nature? Because a lot of people are spending money on TikTok. I don't want to be lost, but I also don't want to build an influencer agency. All right. So now when our search results say, hey, here's the image results, imagine what you could do if you pulled out all those images. And I can prioritize getting this out to you all and recording a video to show you how to do it if you want it. So you got to tell me. Um, so what I did for one of our clients is I took all the images in the image pack that Google had. Because Google feels like these are the best answers for brick fireplace ideas, okay? Then I put them all through the Vision API, and then I was able to take what my client was showing at the time, and then I was able to build a thing in Power BI that compared all those images. I had 18 images. 18 out of 18 had wood. 15 out of 18 had interior design. 13 out of 18 had living room. And we had none of those. Make a better feed. Make a better landing page make a better TikTok ad. And I'm not saying you got to get rid of those things, but at least wouldn't you test it? At least wouldn't you test it? Somebody goes, well, why do you want to test it? Because our image has none of the characteristics of the other 18 images that Google has learned are the right answer for somebody searching for this. Why would I ignore those images? You know why you ignore those images? Because there ain't a freaking tool on the planet that will suck out the URLs of all those images and run them through the Vision API. That's why you don't have it, but you know you want it. So... Google this, and this is one of the tools that started. I didn't build it. It's somebody else. It'll at least let you connect Vision API um, to Google Sheets. So now you can bring in all those characteristics of images into Google Sheets at scale. It's a start. 
us that. Please find a way to do that. I think we would love you for that. Because it's really freaking hard to get the image URLs out and get the URLs to even do the lookups. It's not easy. But you can fiver that shit. All right, so hopefully so far today is not disappointing. Let me wrap this thing up. This is so unfair. Image search. All right. Oh, my God, I'm over. All right, so I'm like, this is just ridiculous. I practiced this like six times. All right, image search. Image search. You've got to watch image search because you can't just blindly be like, well, it's image search. It's great. No, it's not always fucking good. So I put this girl in here, right, and I, she gets her cornrows because when my clients were being searched for black OBGYN, I'm trying to see if I can find that at scale with the images. I'm trying to see, was Google identifying black people at scale? But they're like, ooh, that might be used for racist shit. So we won't put black in there. We're going to put in cornrows. I'm like, same shit, dog. But <laughs> so she's got cornrows. But then it's like street fashion. And I was like, what the fuck? So then I'm looking at her earrings and her face covering, and all of you freaking woke people are like, oh, it's racist. I'm like, I'm not willing to say that just yet. So I take this picture, and I move down to, I swipe right down to sister girl number two, and then I put her in, and I'm like, now she's got a lab coat and a stethoscope, and it's like street fashion, and I'm like, wait a second. Now this is starting to sound super racist. So then I'm like, all right, but I'm like, well, she's got this zipper thing underneath. I'm trying to give Google an excuse. So then we took the most vanilla black woman that was in, a, that was in like a, a stethoscope and a jacket. It was like street fashion. And this is what I love. So all you individual consultants, get people around you to bounce ideas off of. Because you know what? I came up with this. And then my team was like, let's find somebody else that's got a stethoscope in this. And then another team member was like, let's paint her in white and see if it goes away. And they was like, oh, shit. Street fashion goes away the minute you paint her face white. So Google, tell me about your inclusive phone. <laughs> Will, you can see your black family. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I, I, I don't even know what to do. So Ma's team, I know that you get in trouble if I stay late. So I'm going to, I can mask up and try to finish outside or something if I can't keep going, but I don't want to break the rules. Y'all don't get to say that. They got to pay the fines. And I ain't paying. So um, can the gods come in and say like, you got to shut down or will you have to finish in five minutes or you have to get off stage now? Keep Jesus. going. There we go. All right. So I'm really sorry. Like I practiced this six times on my Miss Ross's presentation practicing and it worked so much faster before. So you got to stop and ask yourself, where do these things come from? They come from the fact that Google has more data than all of us. They know what we search for after we search. So it's a customer empathy opportunity. That's why I have 900,000 questions indexed because I want to know every time a question shows up for any search query that my client ever has shown up for, okay? So then you start to learn things like which domains are starting to get the most answers. It's a trust signal to me, okay? I really like things like how many, so like think about when you have data, you get to not do best practice because best practice is something we're all going to make up, right? So if a client asks you today, hey, um, how many, uh, answers can you get with a single page in Google Answers? Y'all gonna make some shit up. I open up Looker and I'm like, well, and across my entire data warehouse of 900,000 questions, I can see that there's a singular URL that has 395 questions, 395 unique questions are answered with one URL. And then I can just hit the drop down up there on the left and select each client and see who is the outlier for all of them and how are they structuring their pages so that we can copy that shit and beat them. Then I do the same thing on the other side. Okay, how many search terms are triggering that question? Okay, so that first question is being triggered by 4,400 unique search terms, probably really on my customer's mind. So maybe I should address that in my landing page. And the real fun part is when you join it to PPC, which I'm gonna show you in a second. Anybody here in the travel space, you wanna be searching your questions for words like safety, because you probably don't always know when certain places are becoming unsafe to go, and thus nothing concerns me more than the safety of my family, right? So if you start seeing, so Google learns, oh shit, when people were typing in Costa Rica, they started typing in safety after that. You gotta mine the actual engrams of the, of the questions to know this is on my customer's mind now. What do I need to know about how to address that concern? All right. Anybody here ever got an MBA, you probably wondered whether or not it was worth it. It's sitting right there, right? <laughs> so 
Most of you are like, well, yeah, well, of course, um, whether or not something's worth it, it's on people's minds. But when you mine this stuff at scale, you start finding the one person that's like, here's how much you're going to make after three years. And then I clicked on the next PPC ad and the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. And none of them literally tell you whether or not they believe it is worth getting an MBA when that is the number one question on every person who searches for online MBA's mind. It's crazy. So now what I do, because I have to do everything at scale, right? So now what I do is I'm going to say, take all those in, take all my clients. I'm going to search for worth it in the people also ask question. And I'm saying, hey, client, you know, you spent 12% of your budget last, last month, last year on keywords that triggered the question whether or not it was worth it. And your CPA, when that question shows up, is two times higher than your average CPA, which means you're probably not answering that question very well. And then because we do this at scale, I scroll, scroll down to the client number three, and I call them up next. And I go, hey, you know what? You have an 842% higher CPA when people are asking questions around if something is worth it that you offer. Here's your landing page. We are not giving people the information to know if it's worth it or not. And that's why they're clicking on your ads 15 times before they convert. And that's why you're paying so much more than you have to pay for that customer. All right, I'm doing my best to hurry up, Moss people. So I am starting, so um, Sear is going to tweet out, I know all this Power BI shit is tough, um, and you're like, we're all lazy, but Sear account's gonna tweet out, one of my team members, God bless her, her name's Catherine Owens. If you know her, I've worked with her. I'm so glad I get a chance to work with her. She um, was like, I wanna take this Power BI thing you built, Will, about these PAAs, and give something to people at MozCon that they can just do in a Google Sheet. Because it's a lot of work, Will, to go from I don't know Power BI up to like, now I got to learn Power BI and all this stuff. So there's going to be, we're going to tweet out a sheet that you can copy to do this stuff yourself. But what we're now doing is we're engramming all of the questions. The people also ask questions to find out what's trending on people's minds for our clients. And then we can see if the CPA is higher or not. And that's an indication of whether or not we're answering those questions. Next thing that we're going to give you guys is um, we took the top 1 million sites on um, Majestic. Uh, this guy who only worked at Sear for seven months, but he freaking had a massive impact impact for us. He built a scraper to basically go over the 1 million sites and determine whether or not it's got an ads.txt off of the root. If it's got an ads.txt off of the root, it's a high likelihood that it's a publisher, right? So what we're trying to do is figure out how can we determine if we got to sound more like a publisher at scale. So what we did, we took the pay data, took his custom data set and organic, and now we're able to say things like, hey, you know what? Um, where are their keywords where 80% of the top 10 are all publishers? We can share that, million, that list of a million. It's jacked up. It's not working great, but it's better than what you have today because I don't know how you're finding publishers at scale. This is the top 1 million sites and whether or not they have an ads.txt on their domain. All right. What we ended up finding is for this one client that if they have five or more publishers in the search result, that was our CPA. If it's six or more or it's five or fewer versus six or more, that's their average CPA. So when we don't sound like a publisher, it costs us money. Notice how I'm bringing this back to money and revenue. That's, wait, wait, why am I paying that much more, Will? Well, because Google wants publishers and you're unwilling to sound like a publisher because all you want to ever do is slap a form on everybody and have them get in your funnel as soon as humanly possible. My PPC people, if you're ever like, I shouldn't be bidding in Canada and you negate the word Canada, Google will show your ads to all kinds of Canadian queries that you don't know about because they got to give their people raises this year, right? On your freaking paid search budget. So something that I like to do, like the word Brampton to me means nothing. How am I supposed to monitor every single search term for every client because I owe it to them to protect their budget like it was my fucking own? So then I'm like, well, okay, how do I do this at scale? I got all this scrape for every one of their search terms. I know what I'm going to do. Anywhere a .ca shows up more than three times in the top 10, I'm going to assume that the word Brampton means Canada. Done. Here's your list of negatives. Because if you say you don't want to show up for Canada keywords, they'll let you show up for Toronto. You're like, come on, dog. That ain't right. All right, I'm going to have to skip that one. So here's what I want you to do as I wrap up. Just start keeping an eye out for this stuff, you guys. Like, I found um, BetterHelp bidding on uh, getting triple dipping, right? And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So the search term is therapist. And just start looking at these related searches through a different lens. Okay, so some people want it close. Some people want it online. Thanks. So, but looking at that, think of a strategy, Stop there and think of a strategy. Hey, you know what? I want to change our landing pages to see if somebody's willing to do it online or if they only want near me or both. Now you're gaining intelligence on that search query and how people kind of break out. Unique intelligence. Then the word therapist for me triggers, triggers black therapist. 
near me and black therapists in Philadelphia. I didn't search for the word black therapist. I searched for the word therapist. So now I'm saying, hey, client, um, I think people might be searching by race, which then triggered me to look up LGBTQ. Then I found out that a lot of people search for OBGYNs um, as to whether or not they're Indian or not. And I was like, oh, snap. Like, we got to come up with a little rainbow coalition here of ways to talk to our customer better. And then I show them all the paid search terms that are missing out on all this stuff. All right, let me skip this, this, and that. Insurance. I don't have a therapist. Sorry, Christy. I don't have a therapist. Um, but if I'm marketing for a therapist, like, I need to know that insurance matters to people. And I may or may not get that information from them. So I hope that today wasn't disappointing. And I'm sorry I had to go through that last part so fast. I'm out of practice on presenting live. But I want you to take this away. Start thinking, where are decisions in my company being made where I might be able to add unique value because I saw Will Reynolds present that stuff and got me to think differently, finally, after 10 years of pouring his heart out about this stuff, to, to get in that room and show people what an SEO is capable of. I want you to ask yourself that. Because I think this presentation only gets you up to the ledge. You're going to have to find greatness yourself. You're going to have to freaking jump off that ledge. I've showed you what's possible. You're going to have to be the one to jump. And I'm going to leave you with this. Because there's a lot of people in our world that are overlooked. I was practicing my slide decks, which I thought I would finish on time. And I'm in the speaker's lounge. And one of the attendants here, big up the, the, the attendants and the workers here that helped this thing to go off that work at the Seattle Convention Center. Um, you guys probably don't get a lot of shout outs, but I recognize some of the hard work you guys were putting in. So this woman comes in to put in like the, 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 the cookies or whatever. There's cookies back there, y'all. So she goes to put in like the snacks or the cookies or whatever, and they're chocolate chip. And, sh and she's noticing that this, I'm watching her while I'm practicing woefully my slide timing. And I'm watching her and she's looking at the, up in the sky and she's like, oh, the sun's starting to come in. She puts her hands on them and she's like, oh, they're starting to get warm and moves them to the cold area of the room and then took the chips or whatever and put them under the other table where the sun was. To me, that is greatness. Because it's you're taking what your job is, which is to bring in these chips and give it to some freaking guy that's yelling his head off, practicing some slides. And while nobody was watching, she took the time to be like, I want to make sure that the next person that comes in after me doesn't get some melted ass cookies or melted ass kind bars or whatever it was. So I want you all to find your internal greatness. And next time you have the chance to drop off the tray and be like, my job is done, 16,000 word audit, put your hand over that, make sure it's a little bit warm or hot for the next person and take care of them before you take care of yourself. Thank you so much for giving me the extra time. Have a great day, guys. Thank you.